Greetings. So this week we are talking about the interesting narrative of the life of Olauda Equiano from 1789. And before we dive into the text, I just want to provide a little bit of a background um, on the author himself. So he's born in 1745 in uh, Guinea, he says, which today is the, the Igbo region of Nigeria. Um, he talks about how he's kind of grows up under the, um, somewhere near Benin, basically. So that gives us a sense of kind of geographical location. Um, he's kidnapped and sold into slavery when he's 12 years old, as he describes in the second chapter, which I wanted you to read for today. He's bought by masters in Bermuda, then in Virginia, and finally in Britain. When he's in Britain, he actually ends up buying his own freedom in 1766. He is an active member of the Sons of Africa, an abolitionist group of African descendants living in Britain. And <clears throat> one of the things he's known for, um, in addition to kind of writing this influential uh, slave narrative, is uh, he, he's also known for helping to bring attention to the Zong Massacre and the horrors of the Middle Passage. And you kind of get a, a taste of that, I think, in the, the second chapter, which I wanted you to read, to read for today, um, where he talks about being on the slave ship. But to just give you a geographical idea here, Benin, you can see here on this map, um, is here, you know, fairly close to the, the coast of um, western, yeah, west coast of Africa. Um, but you can also see the, the region of Guinea here. Um, and again, he says in, in the second chapter how he's kind of kidnapped from his home and then sold several times before he actually makes it to the coast where he's then sold to European traders. So the Zong Massacre, which I mentioned um, two slides back, actually occurs in November of 1781. This is when a slave trading syndicate takes out insurance on their slaves. And again, this story really illustrates, I think, the, the extent to which human beings were thought of as nothing more than, than chattel or as you know property that, that could be profited from or, or lost in, you know, in route. Um, so what happened was when the ship ran low on drinking water, the crew to kind of preserve drink, drinking water, um, they had this idea that they could begin throwing slaves overboard, which would not only save them drinking water, but it would also allow them to kind of cash in on the insurance because they could claim because they had insurance on their slaves, they could take out a claim on them. Um, so the insurance company takes them to court when they file a claim on the slaves, quote unquote, lost at sea. The judge rules in the insurance company's favor, um, saying that they they do not have to pay the these the, the syndicate who threw the slaves overboard. Um, but Equiano's involvement in this was that he actually wanted to prosecute the crew for murder. Um, and the fact that he was unsuccessful in doing that, I think just reinforces the idea that, um, again, slaves were thought of as nothing more than, than property. There, there was no murder that occurred here because um, these human beings were not thought of as human beings in the eyes of the law. Um, to, a few dates to keep in mind um, as you read this text too. Just to give you a sense of how early this is, again, this is published in the late 18th century, but it's not until the early 19th century in 1807 when the British abolish the slave trade. Slavery itself continues in Britain and the colonies until 1833. And then, as you probably know, um, it's not in, in the U.S., it's not until 1865 with the Emancipation Proclamation and the passing of the 13th Amendment when slavery as an institution ends um, in the U.S. So, again, we're, when Equiano is writing, he's still several decades away from this. He actually dies uh, before the turn of the 19th century, so he never gets to see any of this kind of come to fruition. Um, but this this is an, an important narrative. Um, by 1792, only a few years after it was published, it's published throughout Europe and the U.S. in nine different editions. It's kind of the first influential slave narrative. There are other slave narratives before this. <coughs> Excuse me. 
but um, this is the one that kind of establishes a genre and, and gains traction. And um, it's also a major, major catalyst for the abolitionist movement, especially in Britain. Um, again, the first chapter for this week, he kind of goes over the, the culture of ben the people of Benin and it, what his childhood was like. He describes this kind of very idyllic, happy childhood. And then in chapter two, we learn of how he was captured um, how he was captured with his sister, eventually separated from his sister, um, sold several times, then he's finally sold to Europeans on the coast. He uh, describes the horrors of the slave ship and finally arrives in Barbados, where he's sold again. So as you're reading the text this week, I want you, some things I'd like you to keep in mind, or some questions that come up for me, I guess, um, include the following. First, how does Equiano attempt to appeal to an audience that might actually support slavery? So how is he kind of reaching across the aisle um, and maybe hoping that somebody who does support slavery picks up his book and, uh, I don't know, has an open mind about, about it um, or wants to hear his story for some reason? Um, and a related question to that is, how does he actually represent Africa? How does he represent his life in Benin? Um, does his narrative showcase a primitive and perhaps uncivilized way of life, which is, again, the dominant narrative about um, that kind of justifies that, again, this white supremacist narrative uses to justify um, the enslavement of Africans, right? Is that they're primitive, um, they're not fit for anything else other than slavery. Or is his narrative trying to emphasize a kind of utopic ideal of civilization and culture to kind of bring attention to what, what is being destroyed by the, the European and American institution of slavery? So to give a quick example here of just what I'm talking about, um, it, on page 36, right, he says, again, speaking about the people of Benin, he says, we are almost a nation of dancers, musicians, and poets. Thus, every great event, such as a triumphant return from battle or other cause of public rejoicing, is celebrated in public dances, which are accompanied with songs and music suited to the occasion. Right, so on the one hand, this is very much trying to kind of draw a bridge between um, this culture that Europeans might have no idea about and European culture, right? Because Europeans think of themselves as cultured because they have things like dance and music and poetry. Um, those are the things that kind of mark civility for Europeans and Americans during this time. Um, so he, again, he, he's trying to say that, look, we, we have this in Africa too, right? Um, but later on, on page 38, he also, I mean, he's talking about like the, the architecture of their houses, like what their houses look like. Um, uh, ba, ba, ba. our buildings we study convenience rather than ornament right they're very simple structures <coughs> um, and then he also says as we live in a country where nature is prodigal of her favors our wants are few and easily supplied we have few manufacturers they consist for the most part of calicos earthenware ornaments and instruments of war and husbandry um in such a state, money is of little use. However, we have some small pieces of coin, right? So again, we're trying to draw a, con a contrast here between European culture where money seems to be like a god almost, where money is everything. He's sort of saying here, we don't really worry about money. Um, and again, I, I think it's possible for a European reader at the time to maybe read this and say, well, look, here's an argument for um, this is like primitive because it's not it's not what 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 a European would think of as as kind of um, civilized or or um, because it's so different, I guess, from European culture. Um, but again, I think the point that Equiano is actually trying to make here is 
has more to do with like, look, this is what I lost when I was enslaved. I, I had this kind of idyllic Edenic almost, um, childhood and culture and this was taken away from me um and then this other thing was kind of imposed on me right um so just keep keep that question in mind like what how is he representing this how is he representing his his childhood his um his part of benin and what effect does he hope that that kind of has on the on the reader and who his audience might be. Another question I'd like you to keep in mind is how does Equiano challenge the racist hierarchical ideology? Um, again, the, the dominant narrative during this time is that um, white people are superior, black people are inferior, and um, again, a lot of, you see a lot of arguments get made about kind of reinforcing and justifying that um, that argument in, you know, the poetry of the of Europeans, the philosophy of Europeans, Enlightenment philosophy, for example, or even uh, the kind of pseudosciences that emerged during this time. Um, but again, on, on page 39 here, he kind of interacts with this idea. Um, he he sort of pushes pushes against the narrative of black as inferior or ugly or deformed or less than um, by saying he says deformity is indeed unknown amongst us right i mean that sh i mean that of shape numbers of the natives of Ibo now live in london might be brought in support of this assertion for in regard to complexion ideas of beauty are wholly relative i remember while in africa to have seen three negro children who were tawny and another quite white who were universally regarded by myself and the natives in general, as far as related to their complexions as deformed. Um, so again, he's just trying to kind of push against that, that idea, um, the construction of blackness as something other than, um, and here it's interesting. He even kind of complicates this idea that when you say African, you actually mean black. Because here he says, um, I saw three three Negro children, one of who was tawny, another who was quite white. So he's kind of challenging the idea that um, African equals black here. Um, and discrediting this notion that skin color has anything to do with kind of um, what's on the inside, so to speak. Um yeah, in another moment on, on page 44, he, he makes this really interesting connection to, um, uh, to suggest that um, Dr. Gill in his commentary on Genesis ably deduces the pedigree of the Africans from Afra or Afra, the descendants of Abraham. Um, so he's, he's kind of making this argument that like the Israelites in their primitive state, our government was conducted by our chiefs or judges, our wise men and elders, and the head of the family with us enjoyed a similar authority over his household with that which is ascribed to Abraham and the other patriarchs. Um, so he's making this comparison between basically the Jews as they're represented in the Bible and um, his whole representation of his culture. Um in Africa, in, in Benin, specifically. Um, so again, is that an attempt to kind of reach a Christian audience um, or, or to kind of use the Bible to support his particular representation of Benin? Um, a couple other questions I'd like you to keep in mind. Um, why do you think he stresses that he's treated well by his masters in Africa? On page 50, like, do you think he's um, trying to, to, to maybe showcase the horrors of how Europeans treat their slaves in comparison to how, to how slavery functions in Africa? Why do you think he's worried that Europeans will eat him? How does that kind of flip the narrative of um, African as cannibal, maybe, on its, on its ear, which is definitely getting constructed during this time? 
And finally, in the last part of chapter two, how does he appeal to a Christian audience? Like, what is he actually saying there? 